he's in the, he, he, wants to, he wants to talk with me. He wants to hear from us. That just thrills me, right? And at the same time, I feel like I feel remorse. I feel like, oh, how often do I do that? And so easily slips into this idea of shame or guilt or you don't pray enough for all those things, which of course, no one prays enough, right? I mean, that's, but it, it, it's, it, it goes from this joyful thing that I could get to do, that I can get to move into to, to oh, you haven't done that enough, there's something wrong with you. And that is just a, a lie from the devil. I mean, that is just something that he's trying to push on us and he, he's trying to move it towards, if you don't pray enough, you're not acceptable to God, right? Well, that defies everything we believe in the gospel. It's not about that. So I want to invite you today, as we look at, honestly, as we look at one of, one of the most convoluted prayers in the Bible, I think, uh, this morning, I'm very excited about this, when I saw the, the, the layout and saw that I was handed uh, Jonah chapter 2, I was like, oh yes, this is the bomb, but I am going to, we're going to go to Jonah chapter 2. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, you could open up to Jonah chapter two, but we're gonna take a while to get there, so uh, just hold on a minute, because what I wanna do is, <laughs> Jonah chapter two makes no sense until you understand the other three chapters of the book of Jonah, okay? So if you don't get Jonah, you don't get chapter two. So very briefly, by the way, when a pastor says briefly, that, <laughs> that's a lie. Uh, I wanna go through the book of Jonah with you, just in a, in a buggy ride, okay? So here we go. I'm not going to read it all, of course, but you could go there. Uh, Jonah is a prophet in the Old Testament. It's called one of the minor prophets. The only reason he's called minor is it's not that he hasn't made it to the majors yet. It's just, he, they're small. It's four chapters long. And it happens in that time period where Israel is on the border of exile or something like that. So Israel's history is that different nations have come in and they've exiled them, okay? And so the book of Jonah happens somewhere in that period and they, uh, Jonah is, it says, Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Now, if you do any research on the book of Jonah, uh, and you read modern scholars on this, they're divided on a question. And the question is, what is this book? I mean, is this book actually a recounting of an actual event or, or a facsimile of an event? Or is it just like Jesus telling a parable, Right? Now, and I think there's, there's good debates on both sides. I'm gonna give you four reasons why I think it actually did happen, okay? First of all is the, the author of Jonah, which uh, either is Jonah or someone that Jonah knew because there's things where Jonah's alone and you, 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 you hear his thoughts or you hear his private conversation. So either he told somebody or whatever. The author makes no attempt to make it clear that this is an allegory or historical fiction. That's almost the case, almost always the case in the Old Testament. You know, they'll tell the story. In the case of the New Testament, Jesus says he told them a parable or something. There's nothing like that in the beginning of this. So it makes it sound like it's historical. Two, uh, everyone up until the 9th century, 19th century, so that's the 1800s, uh, held that the, the book was a historical thing. It was in the 1800s when people were doing uh, Bible study and looking at scriptures, and, and there were some presuppositions they had. Number one, miracles don't happen. Number two, fish don't eat people, right? So that can't have happened, so therefore, this has to just be a, a myth or something we're telling. So there were some presuppositions that led to this idea that it wasn't uh, history. Three, um, Jesus uses Jonah to describe another historical fact that was going to happen, his death and re resurrection. Now, it's possible you could say, uh, uh, you could talk about a non-historical event to talk about a historical event. I know, I get that. You could say, just like Jack Bauer did something. Is that too, too late? Nobody knows what that is anymore. Anyway, 24. Uh, like th you could do that, but it's a little weird to do that. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus refers to this and because they're begging him for a sign, and they say, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, and we'll see what this, how this plays out, right? Because saying that is not the most nicest compliment, will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. 
So the Ninevites are like squeaky clean to compare to you guys. And we'll get there in just a minute. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now one greater than Jonah is here. So it seems a little bit weird that he would talk about just as this happened, so I'm gonna raise from the dead. And which would say, just as this was a fictitious thing, so was my fictitious, I mean, I, I think that's a little weird. But then the one that clinches it for me is just, I mean, my personal experience, right? I've seen all the artwork that the kids have made. <laughs> This is one of my favorites. Like, like, really? Like, let's just think about this just for a second. Here, three-year-old, go into the belly of a whale here for a moment and think about what that felt like. You know, like these kids are gonna need serious trauma counseling when they get older, right? Right, but there's also just a movie made by it. Clear, right? There it is. Um, I absolutely love, I absolutely love <laughs> the, the subtitle, it says Jonah, you know, but then it says fresh fish, mixed vegetables. It's a great title. Now, if you didn't grow up in Veggie Tales, uh, that's, uh, but that's, that's, that's really clever. Okay, so back to the book of Jonah. So I'm, I'm going through this and counting this as a real event that actually took place. And that's significant here because if Jonah's the one that recounts this to someone, it tells me something about Jonah. And we'll, we'll see that here as we move on, okay? So Jonah's given a job, one job. Here's the job. The word of the Lord comes to him and says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Okay, now, uh, you gotta understand a little bit about Nineveh. Nineveh was uh, a country, uh, not, not an Israel, it wasn't a tribe of Israel at all. In fact, they were enemies of Israel. In fact, they were at war with Israel at times. Nineveh come in, they try to take over Israel, right? So Jonah is an Israelite and this is where he's being told to go. And you're supposed to preach against it, which sounds like a great idea, right? Because the wickedness has come up and you're thinking you're gonna go there and preach judgment, right? And so that seems like a, a positive, positive thing. But this is the first time you hear where God is actually moving out to a nation outside, city and a nation here, outside of Israel and telling them to hear something directly from God. First time you see that. And, and Jonah's given this job. And you think... Jonah would say, score, this is great. I'm going into enemy territory. I'm gonna tell him, hey, you're done. God's angry with you. Booyah, that's the message, right? But that's not what happens. Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So here's a little map, okay? So there's Joppa, there's Nineveh, and there's Tarshish, okay? So he's going completely in the other direction and he's gonna take a ship to get there. Now, to just, I won't read this all, but when he gets on the ship, they, they, they try to go through the Mediterranean Sea there and all of a sudden a wicked storm, I mean just horrible storm comes up and all the sailors are freaking out and all the sailors are not uh, followers of God at all. They're pagans, they're worshiping their gods, they're freaking out. And they start to say, what, what's going on here? And so they draw lots, like, who's the problem? It comes out that it's Jonah, because that's what they believed on ships back day. Like, somebody, somebody caused this to take place. And, and Jonah acknowledges that it's him. And it says, then they took Jonah and threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. Okay, so the, the sailors don't want to do this. The sailors do not want to throw him over. But Jonah says, listen, it's me. If you just throw me over, that will solve the problem. And in one way, it's Jonah thinking, well, at least I can't go to Nineveh, right? And we'll, we'll go into his motivations in a minute. As if you were a kid, you heard that he was afraid. No, Jonah is not afraid. There's other emotions going on, but fear is not one of them. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now, catch the irony here, okay? Here's these pagan sailors they don't want to get rid of Jonah. Jonah's fleeing from God. Jonah gets thrown overboard. They sacrifice to God while Jonah's being disobedient. That is not unironic, okay? Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Doesn't actually say a whale, sorry. Big fish, big, massive walleye. And Jonah was in the belly of this walleye for three days and three nights. And that's what we know about the story, right? We know this Jonah and the whale, and there he is, and he, he um, you know, he's in that whale. And that's where we're gonna go in chapter two. 
What happens while Jonah is in the belly of this whale? There's a prayer that he utters. We're gonna walk through it. I'm gonna skip that now. I'm gonna come back to it. Just want you to see the rest of this. After Jonah gets out of the whale, spoiler alert, he does get out of the whale. God gives him a second chance. And it says this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it to it the message I give you. Okay? So he does that. This time he shows up. God tells him a message. He says, hey, repent. Repent from your evil ways. Calamity is coming. And so they go, and then Jonah starts preaching. Now, let me just, I know it seems a little weird, some foreigner coming, but let's just say this. You, you see this foreigner, he comes up to you. He had, he, you know, very dark skin, but his skin has been somewhat dissolved by the belly of this fish. So it's kind of bleached. The guy reeks of the inside of a fish, right? He's got seaweed hanging around him. And he walks up to you and he says, repent. What do you do? I would repent. I would just repent. I mean, of what? I don't know. But dude, you do not look well. I'm going to do that, right? And so that's what he does. He goes around there and the people repent. The whole, this pagan nation, this brutal nation, they repent. And it says then, when God saw what they did, the end of chapter three, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. It did not bring them the destruction he had threatened. Now you think, this is a success story, right? Jonah didn't want to go, but he goes, he goes, preaches. It's a great, me- revival happens. Churches are filled. This is awesome. The, the, this is the, what he wants, right? Jonah is a rock star. These people now want to follow God, at least temporarily here, as we see, right? You think that's what it goes, but that's not the end of the story. In fact, that's not the point of the story because the story goes to chapter four and it says, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry, <laughs> Right? Now, it's interesting if you look at this. I don't, I don't know Old Testament Hebrew, but if you just do the double-click thing, which anybody can do, this is how it works out. This is the way that literally says. It says, it was or became evil or wrong to Jonah as a great evil or wrong. <laughs> Jonah's like looking at this going, that's evil. What just happened is wrong. God, you can't do that. That is wrong. It's evil, Right? And it goes on then to, and he prays to the Lord. Another prayer of Jonah. We often look at chapter two, but we miss this one. And it says, oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. Oh, now we're gonna get to his motive. What was going on inside here? And he says, I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. (laughs) That's why he didn't wanna go. He says, listen, the message is repent or calamity will come. Well, if I don't go and tell him about repenting, then calamity will come. Boom, my enemies are toast. This is a good day. That's what he wants. Jonah's not afraid, he's a patriot. And he loves his country to the exclusion of other countries, of everybody else. And God says, no, I'm, I want you to go there and to preach this. And he says, no, I'm not gonna do that because I know you're a compassionate God. So I'm not, I'm not a compassionate prophet. So therefore, I'm not going. That's what's going on. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. For, now just, this is the prayer of Jonah. This is one of our prophets of the Old Testament. This is one of our guys. And he says, now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Or let me just read that a little bit differently. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to live than to die than to live. I do want to go to Nineveh. <laughs> when you want to go to Nineveh, no. That's what it, you got. You've got basically a, a little pouty prophet that is just saying, I don't want to go. I'm not going. I don't go, but I won't like it. And then the people repent and what God wants to have happen. Now he's just, and God cuts right to the heart of the matter and he says this. Have you any right to be angry? Uh, we've preached a Jonah series here. Uh, the very first, the very first thing we ever did at Hope, uh, we were open for four weeks before our grand opening, September of uh, 1996. We preached four weeks on Jonah, and then uh, we did it again a few. Geez, I don't remember. It's probably 12 years later, something like that. Uh, but this question right here is a great question to ask yourself: Do you have any right to be angry? Is there is there something going on? I, 
Why, why, are you, are, why are you so angry, right? And he gets right to Jonah's heart. Why are you so angry? And Jonah doesn't have an answer here. He won't answer him. He's quiet, all right? So what God does is he does an object lesson with Jonah. In, in the second part of chapter four, he does this. And it seems this bizarre thing. Jonah's sitting there, the pouty prophet. He's just angry and bitter. Doesn't want his, you know, the Ninevites to repent. They do. He's sitting there and he's getting hot in the sun. And all of a sudden God makes this vine come up. This vine comes up, it grows. It gives him this great shade. And Jonah says, this is awesome. This is awesome. I've got this, this vine. And then the scorching wind comes and destroys the vine. The vine dies. And Jonah is indignant. He is so angry. And so God answers him. Do you have, God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do. I'm angry enough to die. I'm angry enough to die. Right? This is kind of what you see. This is Jonah's heart. And now comes the point of the book of Jonah, verse 10, of the last, verse 10 and 11, excuse me. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this vine, though you, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And people have interpreted that different ways. Could be that they're uneducated. Could be that it was just that many children, Right? and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And that's it. That's the book of Jonah. God drops that mic, walks off the stage, that's it. We don't hear the end. However, if this is an actual event, I think it is, that means that Jonah had to say this. And that means that Jonah got the message that Jonah ultimately would have repented and seen God's sight, ultimately. Otherwise, he's like, I'm not telling that story. I certainly don't come up looking too good in that story, right? That's the book of Jonah. That is what the whole book is about. And uh, this, this heart of Jonah gets revealed, completely laid bare. Now, with that said, now we'll go back in the story to chapter two, where he's in the belly of the whale, all right? And uh, I'm calling this sermon a prayer from the gut. And so you can take that two ways, right? Huh? Pretty clever. Uh, and then I, I Googled it, and there's this guy that made a book called Praying from the Gut, An Honest Prayer Journal for Teens. And I, I, the, I titled this sermon in 1996, A Prayer from the Gut. This was written in 2008. We've got several copyright infringements going out right now <clears throat> on that. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'm sure I stole it from somebody else, but... If you, 26 years ago, you don't remember that stuff, so it's mine. Uh, why are you so angry about the title? Because I am, enough to die. No, I'm just kidding. The, uh, <laughs> totally kidding. We look at this prayer from the gut. What I want to do is I want to read it, then I just want to walk it through with you in the remainder of our time this morning. Here's, here's the prayer. It says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, um, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, to the earth beneath barred me forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now we have the advantage of seeing the whole book and seeing where Jonah's heart really is. So we know the condition of his heart even in the middle of this fish. Because if you just read this, it seems like it's one way, but then you see where he was still at in his heart and you see it a little bit, little bit differently here. So let's go through it, kind of taking, taking some observations. First, the circumstance that led to this prayer from inside the fish 
Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. So inside the fish, uh, all right, so Jonah was in the water. He got thrown over, and yes, that's, that was very bad, and he possibly would have drowned, but he, he, gets, he gets eaten by a fish or swallowed by a fish, which that doesn't seem a ton better. I mean, it's better in one sense, but it's not in another, right? And so he's still in some significant trouble here. And that is one of the things that drives us to prayer, constant, right? If you, if you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul talks about a thorn that was given to him so he wouldn't be conceited. A thorn in the flesh, he calls it. A messenger of Satan to torment me, he says. And then he goes on to say, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. And that, that phrase three times could be a way of saying, I constantly am asking for God to take it away. And when he's writing this to the Corinthians, he says it happened 14 years ago. So in, 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 in first Corinthians, or excuse me, second Corinthians chapter 12, I might have said first, uh, the, there, uh, uh, there's no indication that he says anything about it went away. So he's living with the, whatever it is, we don't know what it is. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, God just lets you, uh, lets you insert your own struggle right there, whatever it may be. I remember one service, after one service, a guy came down to me and said, I know exactly what it was. Really? Yep, I know for sure. It was internet porn. It's like, ah, uh, might've been lust, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't internet porn. Pretty sure Paul wasn't struggling with internet porn. But whatever your thorn in the flesh is, whatever the ailment is, whatever sin problem you have, it allows you to put it in there. But it drove Paul to pray. And God answers that prayer in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 12. And he says this, not gonna take it away. But my grace is sufficient for you. It's just a great phrase. My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so God will put things in our lives that cause us to move us to prayer. In August of 2016, my wife called me and asked me, are you in your office? And I said, yes. And I, and I came to the office, or excuse me, she came into my office and she looked at me and said words that changed my life. And the, she just said three words and she said, I have cancer. And I, boom, you know, you, it's just those words that just drop you right on the floor. And you know, you don't, you, you, first you kind of are discombobulated uh, and you're not sure what's up and all that. And then all of a sudden you're trying to press in more and you just start, your heart sinks. And she had uh, 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 uterine cancer. And, uh, and in the, in the, in the hist maybe some of you have gone through cancer too, but in the, in the wisdom, and I guess it's good that they tell you, but it's a tech that calls you and says, yeah, you got to wait 10 days to get an appointment. Those 10 days are fun, right? Uh, like what? Uh, and, and I remember we drove home separately and I prayed all the way home and I only prayed two words and they were just, <clears throat> oh God. I just kept saying that. God will bring circumstances into your life that move you to a place of dependence on him, which is, in, in a sense, they are gifts to move us that way. And this is what's happened to Jonah. He is in the midst of real trouble here. And so he moves on here and he says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. So the way this, again, it's kind of poetry, the way this is written. So it makes it kind of sound like I was in the water and you took God, you helped me by getting me into this fish, right? From the depths of the grave, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas and the current swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Now, again, I, I, there's, there's prayers from the gut that are just brutal and honest here. And that's what Jonah is doing. And I love if Jonah actually wrote this or had a lot of hand in writing it because it shows his heart here. He's being real honest here. And he, he blames God. You hurled me into the deep. Re, re, really, Jonah? Really God, really, God did that? Really, Jonah? And it says, the very heart of the seas. And, and, and it, it's kind of like he's saying, thanks, but kind of a backhanded thanks. Then he moves on. Oh, excuse me. Let me just read. This is great. Tim Keller has written a book on Jonah called Rediscovering Jonah. He says this about this. Now we see why we find grace, not at the high points of our lives, 
but in the valley and depths at the bottom. No human heart will learn its sinfulness and impotence by being told it is sinful. It will have to be shown, often in brutal experience. No human heart will dare to believe in such free, costly grace unless it is, only, it is the only hope. It is the combination of, of hard circumstances, insight from the biblical gospel of atonement for sin, and prevailing prayer that can move us to wonder and amazement, even in the darkest, deepest places. So that's what happens. This is God's got Jonah's attention now, right? And so Jonah repents, kind of. It's weird here, right? I said, I've been banished from your sight. Okay. Now, is that repentance? <laughs> He's acknowledging something, but he never says, you know what? I did wrong. I totally disobeyed you. He doesn't say that. He just says, you know what? I've been banished in your sight, yet I will look towards your holy temple. Wow, that's, that's, really, uh, that's a really lame, <laughs> you know? It's like you're disciplining a child and the child says, I've been given a time out by you, but I'm gonna hope in the future. It seems a little bit, you know, hey, wait a minute here now. Uh, the engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head, to the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me, uh, barred me in forever, but you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. So he's acknowledging God's hand in deliverance here, but he's never once said, I did this. I did not obey you, and therefore I'm in this mess. He doesn't ever say that. And it, it's, it's kind of repentance. It's, you know, I give it about a I give it about a two, something like this. This is kind of repentance, right? You're poorly done, right? Now, this is not, if you read on in the Bible, by the way, nobody's repentance is perfect. One of the ones that people often look to is the, the story of the prodigal son. There are famous paintings about the, the return of the son to the, the, the father, and this father engulfs him. And you see this, and you think, yeah, but the son, the prodigal son, when Jesus tells this beautiful story, trying to explain to people who are listening why he hangs out with sinners, people who need the gospel of grace, which is Christ himself, drawing them to himself. And, and he says, ah, what, what, this is what happens when sinners repent. But in, in the prodigal son uh, account, you see this, but we, we get inside the mind of the prodigal son. He's, he's went off, he's spent all the inheritance from the father, he's starving, and he says to himself these words, you know what, how many of my father's servants are eating like pigs, eating like kings, and I'm sitting here with these pigs, right? Uh, this is stupid, I should just go home. His repentance is not noble, it's economic. There is no nobility here. And there's no, he even has to rehearse the story. Father, I'm really sorry. He has to rehearse it because he just needs help. And yet the father receives that. And this too. So we go on in this prayer and it says, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. There's this glimmer of hope that he has. His glimmer of hope when my life was ebbing, this all took place. But then he says this, and this is what I would call really, really great theology and really, really low emotional intelligence, okay? Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. That is worth memorizing. It's such a great verse. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I with a song of thanksgiving, was sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Those rotten Ninevites, they're sacrificing to idols. They forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. Do you hear what's going on here? So Jonah is even at this point in the story saying, I'm the good guy in this story. Now, if the book of Jonah is written about anything, it's Jonah's the bad guy in the story. <laughs> he's clearly the bad guy in the story. And yet he says this line, and it is so prophetic because it comes back 
and it hits Jonah. Listen to Tim Keller on this from his book. He says, in other words, despite his breakthrough here, Jonah has not grasped grace as deeply as we might at first think he has. There is still a sense of superiority and self-righteousness that will cause him to explode in anger when God has mercy on those Jonah sees as his inferiors. He sees the literal idols that the pagans worship and doesn't see the more subtle idols in his own life that keep him from fully grasping that he too, just like the heathen, just like the Ninevites, uh, uh, lives only equally by God's grace. That's, that's Jonah, right? And that's Jonah's prayer of repentance. And it's right before God comes to him a second time and then God responds and he says, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Okay? Wow. So what are, what are some just takeaways here? Let me just give you, let me give you four of them real quick. One, oftentimes prayer comes from the depths. And, and, and even right now, you might be going through something. Every one of us has something that could drive us to prayer deeply, even right now. Oftentimes, God brings uh, extraordinary circumstances that really drive us to prayer. Second thing, prayer is often really ugly at times. When, you, when you're talking to God and you're being honest, it's, it's brutal. And, and if you look at the second prayer of Jonah here in chapter four, when he talks about all these different things and his heart really is exposed, that's why I didn't want to go because I know you're compassionate. I know better than you, God. Whoa, wow, wow, oh, ooh, ow, right? Third thing, God is not threatened by that. God is not threatened by that. God's gonna walk you through that process because he loves you. He's gonna bring things into your life to continue to shape you. But somehow God is not, God is not a pouty God and he's not upset with you because you're being honest. No, but he's gonna, he's gonna walk you through it though too, like he did Jonah. And the fourth thing is, is uh, Jonah's repentance was lame. So is every one of ours. And God still honors it. So I think sometimes the, 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 take, the big takeaway for me here is, I think often when I, I think of, of repenting towards God, uh, and I think that the amount of forgiveness that I'm gonna get is equal to the amount and quality and the sincerity and the correctness of my repentance. And that is totally not true. That is not true. Of course, God wants uh, solid repentance, but repentance doesn't earn forgiveness. What earns forgiveness is Jesus Christ and the finished work on the cross. That's an objective fact. The fact if you believe in that a little bit or a lot doesn't really matter. It's all the same. A passage that I like to read to myself uh, from probably my greatest uh, theologian friend, uh, no longer living, it's Charles Spurgeon. He wrote a book of devotionals called Morning and Evening, all right? And so he wrote one on Jan, or June, it's for June 28th. And it is my favorite one of all the ones he's written. And if you didn't have a devotion this morning, this counts, you can check it off. I'm gonna read to you June 28th. And I read it about every year here because it's just one I need to keep hearing. And here's what he says. He says, it is ever the Holy Spirit's work to turn our eyes away from self to Jesus. But Satan's work is just the opposite of this. For he is constantly trying to make us regard ourselves instead of Christ. He insinuates your sins are too great for pardon. You have no faith. You do not repent enough. You will never be able to continue to the end. You have not the joy of his children. You have such a wavering hold of Jesus. All that's true, right? All these are thoughts about self and we shall never find comfort or assurance by looking within. But the Holy Spirit turns our eyes entirely away from self. He tells us that we are nothing, but that Christ is all in all. Remember, therefore, it is not your hold of Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not your joy in Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not even faith in Christ, though that be the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merits. Therefore, look not so much to your hand with which thou art grasping Christ as to Christ. Look not to your hope, but to Jesus, the source of your hope. Look not to your faith, but to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. We shall never find happiness by looking at our own prayers, our doings, or our feelings. It is what Jesus is, not what we are. 
that gives us rest to the soul. If we would at once overcome Satan and have peace with God, it must be by looking unto Jesus. Keep thine eyes simply on him. Let his death, his sufferings, his merits, his glories, his intercession be fresh upon your mind. When you wake in the morning, look to him. When you lie down at night, look to him. Oh, let not your hope, hopes or fears come between you and Jesus. Follow hard after him and he will never fail you. Here's what I want to do and in, in, uh, in, as we prepare now for a time of communion. I would love to ask you, what does a prayer from the gut look like for you? Right here, right now. What, what is something that God, it doesn't need to be pretty. It doesn't even need to be completely formed. It certainly wasn't for Jonah. What does that look like? And look then to the object of the one, the one who loved you and who died for you, Jesus Christ, and move to him. So here's what I'd like to do. Just as I close in prayer, I want you to be thinking about that. And right as the first song starts, I'd like you just to pray from the gut. Even as you come up and take communion, just have this prayer going. God, what does that look like for me to just lay it all out before you on this, whatever this issue is, whatever God's bringing up in your heart? What would that look like? And just pray that as you come and take communion as we close with these last two songs. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for the life of Jonah. I really want to thank you, Jesus, for your work in his life, that you didn't give up with him. You were patient and kind, offering opportunities, bringing salvation, uh, and, and even working with through his attitude. And God, that's every one of us. We're all a hot mess. So God, I just pray for us. I pray you'd teach us, God, from this. What does it mean to... To, to respond to you and to pray from the gut. Whether it's for the very first time coming to you and saying, yes, Jesus Christ, I need you as Savior and Lord. Or whether it's something that we, maybe some of us got a diagnosis this week or a loved one did or health difficulty or financial problems or, or, or relational strife or whatever it is, God. Would you move in this room by the power of your spirit and bring that up and then give us a gift, God. Give us a gift and that gift would be that even before we leave this room, Lord, even in the next, you know, seven to 10 minutes when we sing these songs, you just allow us to pray that gut right from, or pray that prayer right from the gut. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.